Welcome to this session of ABB Motors Explained. I'm Mac McGee, Training Manager for the ABB NEMA Division. Today we will be covering the subject of the differences between Division I and Division II when talking about hazardous location motors. I have with me today Fred McCutcheon, who is a Technical Specialist for the ABB USL Support Team. Fred has been with ABB for 29 years and has had many years of experience with hazardous location motors. Fred, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So let's dive into the subject of Division I versus Division II, and let's try to clarify what the differences are between them. So Fred, what's the best way to start this discussion? The best place to start would be to explain the differences in Division I and Division II motors. Once I explain those areas, then we can explain the differences in hazardous location motors. Okay, so how would you define a Division I area? The definition of a Division I area is any area where a motor will be running in the presence of an ignitable substance during normal operation. So the ignitable substance can be present all the time or some of the time. The key point is the Division I motor will be operating in the hazardous substance during normal operation. Please note that all hazardous area classifications mentioned here are defined by the NEC, the National Electric Code. So the Division I motor would basically live in this type of environment all the time, correct? Yes, that is correct. So now define the Division II area. Per the NEC, the definition of Division II area is any area where the motor is typically not running in the presence of ignitable substance during normal operation. Only under abnormal conditions, such as an accident or a spill, would the motor see this ignitable substance. So the Division II motor doesn't live in the hazardous environments like the Division I does. That's correct. The main difference between Division I and Division II area is when the hazardous substance is present and for how long. Keep in mind that underneath Division I and II, per the NEC, there are also classes that define the physical properties of the substance. Class I for gas, Class II for dust, and Class III for fibers. Groups define how energetic the substance is once ignited. Class I has groups A, B, C, and D, and Class II has groups E, F, and G. And Class III has no groups assigned to it as it only deals with fibers. Finally, we have the temperature code that sets the maximum surface temperature allowed in hazardous areas, which can vary with classes and groups. Now that we have defined the hazardous areas and the classes and groups, let's now talk about the motors themselves. So Fred, what is the definition of a Division I motor? These are motors that are designed, tested, and certified to operate in Division I areas. These motors have special construction that allows the motor to operate continuously in the presence of a hazardous substance. So how can a Division I motor do this? A Division I motor is designed to contain an ignition of the hazardous substance. Suppose you have a motor in a Division I area and the ignitable substance makes its way into the motor. If this substance ignites, the motor will contain the ignition and allow the gases to escape at a slow enough rate not to ignite the surrounding atmosphere. Okay, so you mentioned the motor is designed to do this. Can you explain some of these design characteristics? I mentioned gases escaping earlier. This is done through what's called flame paths. These are tight tolerance areas longer than normal, such as end plate to motor frame joints and along the motor shaft extensions, for example. Gas is allowed to escape in these areas at a rate slow enough to allow the gas to cool below the auto ignition temperature of the substance. In addition to this, we designed the motor to have a limited external surface temperature during operation, whether it be normal operation or in a failure mode. Another thing that we mentioned is the increased thickness of the casting, such as the motor frame and the end bracket, which helps contain the ignition. So the combination of the flame path, the lower surface temperatures, and material thickness give us a motor that can safely operate in a highly flammable hazardous area. 
Great information, Fred. So now, what about Division 2? Okay, so remember, a Div 2 motor does not normally run in the presence of a hazardous substance. Thus, a Division 2 motor does not have a special enclosure, such as a Division 1 motor. Division 2 motors basically have a standard enclosure. The two things that we are concerned about with a Division 2 motor are the sparking devices and the high surface temperatures. So first, let's look at the sparking devices. We need to ensure that there are no contactors, switches, brushes, or any other sparking devices that could ignite the surrounding atmosphere. This includes no shaft grounding devices such as brushes or grounding rings at least until such time it is determined that these devices do not create enough energy to ignite the surrounding atmosphere. Concerning high surface temperatures, Division II motors must stay within given temperature limits on the external surface as well as internal surfaces of the motor. Remember, we don't have a special enclosure to protect the internal components from hazardous substances. So this is why internal surface temperatures are critical to prevent ignition of the atmosphere. So Fred, how do I know it's a hazardous location motor when I see one? The best way to identify a hazardous location motor is by the nameplate. For a Division I motor, the nameplate will most likely clearly state electric motor for hazardous location. In addition, you will see UL listed on the nameplate, indicating underwriter's laboratory certification. It will also list the classes and groups which identify the hazardous area where it is approved to operate. One thing that you will not find on a Division I motor is the Division classification. This is because the Division I motor is suitable for both Division I and Division II area. As far as Division II goes, you will have a standard nameplate that will have Division II classification marks. These nameplates will clearly state Division II as the motor is suitable only for Division II area. Well, Fred, thank you for your time and expertise today. It's been very informative. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. In summary, let's look at what we covered today. First, we looked at the difference in Division I and Division II areas, with Division I being when the motor is in the presence of an ignitable substance during normal operations, and Division II is not, and only encounters ignitable substances under abnormal conditions, such as a spill or leak. We also looked at the classes and groups that define the hazardous substances. We then looked at the differences in the motors, with Division I having long flame paths, limited surface temperatures, and thicker enclosures, and Division II having a standard enclosure, limited surface temperatures, and not allowing sparking devices. Last, we looked at how to identify Division I and Division II motors, which is, of course, by their nameplates. I hope you have enjoyed this latest session of ABB Motors Explained. I'm Mac McGee, and as always, be safe, and we'll see you next time.